My, my collaborators and I, uh, Jim O'Connell and Nick Lurton Jones, uh, started being interested in grandmothers um, as a consequence of the work we were doing with Hadza Hunter Gathers, who you've been hearing about quite a bit here. Well, our initial expectations were quite different. We were surprised, well, among, we were surprised by a lot of things, but among the things that we were surprised about was what active foragers little kids were, how uh, effective they could be at acquiring their own nutrients and doing a lot of stuff, even when they were a little bitty, but also how incredibly productive the old ladies were and uh, especially at taking the kinds of resources that are difficult to take. They require quite a bit of, of a skill and strength, and the old ladies spend more time doing that than uh, the, the childbearing aged women do. And um, that kind of thing is really tough for little kids. So they, they give it a shot. They try taking resources like this, they know how to do it, but they're not so effective because they're small and, and not so strong. And that means if you're living in an environment where this is a kind of resource you need, it's important as a starch staple, actually this one is, this particular kind of tuber in, in all seasons, then if you can't cover your own action, well, if the kids can't, then you really can't stay there, or this is kind of an evolutionary dead end. And of course, they depend on help from somebody else, which is mom, because um, she's doing that. But you see, this, this mom has a newborn. And what happens when moms have newborns is that, the, uh, that, that newborn's getting quite a bit of attention. So they're doing a little bit less foraging, and it turns out that the correlation between their work and how well their kids are growing disappears when they have newborns, and now it depends on grandmother. And these uh, weaned children, now they, their uh, nutritional requirements are subsidized by their grandmothers. Well, this pattern suggested to us that, wow, okay, we're looking at modern people, uh, that's all we've got left on the planet to look at, but if we think about what we're learning from the trade-offs in this case, it suggests that if we had an ancestral population that was trying to exploit environments like this, and uh, the kinds of resources that little kids were good at began to be less available, then uh, either you'd have to bail and go somewhere else, or mom would have to help the kids. And if she did, then that would be not milk, but something else, and somebody else could help. And if somebody else helped, then she could move on and have the next baby sooner. And that was the basis for the idea that uh, a change in the character of our life history that's really different from what we see in the other living great apes could really have begun with this important role for grandmothers, would, which would make it advantageous for females to be slightly more robust, more have more uh, better built buffers against mortality. Uh, those who were slightly more robust would be able to then, as their fertility was declining, help their daughters, who could have the next baby sooner, and help their grandchildren so their survival wouldn't decline, and that the genes associated with that would then tend to, under those circumstances, increase in frequency and shift a whole array of features of, of life history. Um, but one of the first objections that, that people might make to, to that hypothesis is to say, but wait a minute, don't we all know that, okay, we look around now and look, oh, all these old people here now, but isn't that a result of recent history? You know, we've got public health, we've got scientific medicine, we've got all kinds of things that have made mortality go way down. And this uh, figure here is, is widely reprinted representing what are essentially facts, but it is often misread. So here we've got time on the horizontal axis going from the middle of the 19th century to up to the one we're in, and not much change in the age of menopause, but this substantial shift in female life expectancy. So, so pictures like this are often read to say, 
Well, it didn't used to be that women lived past the age of menopause. That's something that is, is very recent. And that's because we're not all demographers, that we tend to misread this. If we look at the, um, the population that was actually the global winner for life expectancy right down there in the middle of the 19th century, it's Sweden. And this is the actual population of Sweden in, in 1840. And here we're just looking at the female side. So this is just the girls, so it's half the population pyramid. And these are uh, girls, immatures, and the green bars then are women in the childbearing ages. And then we got all those women up there who are past their childbearing years. So even though, Life expectancy in this population is 44 years, because remember, this was the global winner in uh, 1840. A third of the, of the adults, if we just look at the women, are past the age of 45, which is essentially when fertility starts to approach zero in human populations. And if we talk about another aspect of the demography, uh, if you're a little girl and you're lucky enough to live to the age of 15, you've still got an 80% chance of living throughout and past your childbearing years in a population like this. And in fact, that this general uh, this general pattern, this are, so we were looking at Sweden, that's an agricultural population in the middle of the 19th century. Here are a bunch of hunter-gatherer populations. The Hadza I was talking about a minute ago are right here. Here are the Ache, hunter-gatherers in, in um, uh, eastern Paraguay, so that's in the New World, really different population histories. Here are uh, Bushmen around Dobi, the most famous hunter-gatherers in the world, and there's some interesting differences among these cases, but in general, the pictures are pretty similar. In all of these cases, life expectancy at birth is way less than 40, but a huge bunch of the uh, adults are past their childbearing years. And in fact, I've, I've uh, shown you three uh, human populations, and I'm going to use the Hadza to represent humans. So this is, you know, modern folks. Uh, and, and compare, this becomes especially clear what the differences are if I compare uh, this to data that we now have for wild chimpanzees. Now, in, in both of these cases and in the ones that we were looking at a minute ago, these are models that are based on life tables. So we've done some kind of magic with the, uh, getting rid of all the sort of variation that goes with, with real life to construct this. But this is what uh, the, the synthetic uh, life table across five different wild chimpanzee study sites shows for females, again, we're just looking at female chimpanzees, and as you can see, uh, just this tiny fraction of females are past the, the childbearing years. I mean, it's statistically, they're not there. And here's the human case, again, represented by the Hadza. And just to underline this, if we talk about the, the proportion of survivors as we move through the childbearing years, what happens to chimpanzees as and other living great apes is that as you move through the childbearing years, the, the fraction of survivors goes down, 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 and practically nobody survives the childbearing years. So adults almost all die during those years. Not the case in human populations, even in cases where mortality is as high as it is here. If you've been lucky enough to live to the age of 15, then uh, you've got a really damn good chance of living past your childbearing years. That isn't when most women die. Um, and here I've shown the end of fertility as at about 45 in both cases. You might want to say, should I believe something like that? Well, we actually can look at how similar what happens in the ovaries of chimpanzees and humans is. The, these are sections from chimpanzee ovaries, and these are sections from human ovaries. And um, uh, all this amazing stuff about human reproductive physiology, we don't have time to go into, but, but the females start out with this enormous number of primordial follicles of, of, of oocytes that then they just start losing. In fact, they start losing them before birth, and it's just downhill after that. And there are all these gazillions of them in the, right around the age of birth. This chimpanzee was three months old when she died. Um, 
it, by the middle 20s, there aren't so many left, but by the time we get up here to the age in which there's essentially no fertility, finding one of those is almost impossible. It's very hard to tell the difference between a chimpanzee and, and a human ovary, and we actually have a big enough sample, uh, oh, they're tiny, really, but anyway, a big enough one that we can actually, so these are post-mortem uh, ovarian sections from chimpanzees, and we can count the number of primordial follicles. Now, these are just sections, so they're just slices through an ovary. It's going to be a tiny sample, and, but compare them to uh, the classic human data sets. And if we do, we can only go up to the age of 47. That was, that was the oldest sample we had of chimpanzees, but um, here, the, the, the whole thing has been logged, but there is no statistically significant difference between the slopes of those two lines. We are losing our oocytes at the same rate in both species. So, so what's going on is that the um, ova pattern of ovarian aging looks so similar in us and chimpanzees. It looks like the ancestral pattern really hasn't changed. But then there's all the rest of our physiology. Uh, and, and we look at, at other kinds of things, which I was illustrating with these hardworking Hadza grandmothers, but you know, look around or look at me, I can still you know, uh, dance and sing and so on. You know, stuff is more or less working, even though I'm postmenopausal, right? Um, now, grandmothering is a contender for why this sort of thing was favored in our evolution. But how do we do it? I mean, how is this possible? And that question really arises as a consequence of, well, I was showing you what happens with the disappearance of these follicles, and when they are, when there's no more ovulation, then there's no more secretion of estrogen from the ovaries. And yet, there are all these things for which you need estrogen to keep it ticking over. And th this is true for um, uh, all kinds of, uh, mammals, but we need all these things to keep so much of our physiology still repaired. Um, and so, uh, you know, how do we square this circle? What could be going on? There is actually a pretty good contender. You know, the, the estrogen that's in peripheral tissues can come from the ovaries, but it also comes from steroids that are produced by the adrenal. So these precursors, DHEA and DHEAS, can be converted in peripheral tissues if they have the right enzymes and accessory proteins, then they're converted into estrogen and um, can, can do what estrogen needs to do to keep those peripheral tissues going. And, and this particular one, DHEA and DHEAS, in general, it's been characterized as higher in primates than in non-primate mammals, and we belong to an order of animals that are relatively long live for their body size, so mm, those things are kind of going together. Uh, the endocrinologist, Fernand Labrie, has, has pointed out that if we look at levels of DHEAS, which have attracted attention because our, our, uh, our circulating levels of DHEAS are so high, this is true of all of us, it's the highest, the, the circulating levels are by far the highest in, of DHEAS of any hormone in your body. And as Labrie says, you know, five to, or let's see, what is that, four to five orders of magnitude higher than estradiol. And, and as he has focused, uh, he and others have focused attention especially on how those precursors are then being converted in peripheral tissues to estrogens. And Labrie has gone so far as to say, even if we talk about women who are still cycling, 75% of the estrogen in peripheral tissues is, uh, is coming from the, the adrenals, the conversion of DHEA. And then, of course, after menopause, it's 100%. So, if we've got that story on the table, and now we look at the pattern that I was highlighting before. You know, here is this Hadza woman who's in her middle 60s when this photograph is taken. You know, she is um, doing this really energetically expensive, uh, fancy feat of engineering to dig these um, underground storage organs. She is well past menopause, and she is still strong and very productive. 
Here, to represent what happens in chimpanzees is Gamma, who was lucky enough to be, or anyway, who was living at Yerkes, so she had you know, medical attention, there was the cafeteria, all those things. And uh, so she's in her 50s when that photograph is taken, but she's a very old lady, right? And most chimpanzees are dying while their ovaries are still working. And they have geriatric symptoms of being, you know, frail and having trouble climbing trees and so on. So um, here is uh, what the uh, circulating levels of DHEAS look like in women. This is, these are published data sets on women and where we could pull out individual levels and uh, the, the a model through this, so uh, you get to see how, how variable it actually is, but there's, there is the best model to fit this. And primatologists who study aging in other primates have, have suggested that the rate of decline in this hormone, in DHEAS, is a good biomarker for aging in primates in general based on the human numbers and numbers from a couple of macaque species and baboons in which there seemed to be a correlation with the circulating level and its rate of decline and average adult lifespan. And so they've suggested that uh, this rate of decline is a biomarker of aging in primates. But we don't know about our closest living relatives, or there had not been any data. And so if we were to take the arguments that, that the, the primate aging people have, have developed, and we think, okay, maybe that is a good biomarker of aging, then we should expect it to decline twice as fast in chimpanzees as in humans. And if it did, then maybe that would explain why, if, if that's really necessary to keep these tissues uh, well maintained, then if it declines that fast in chimpanzees, that would help explain why they have these geriatric symptoms even in, in their fertile years and slower in women. There's a hypothesis. Well, we, uh, for chimpanzees who were sedated for other reasons, uh, their health checks, we got samples. And um, this is what uh, the, the, uh, the circulating levels look like. It turns out that you know, the best model through that looks like that. Wow, it is not the case that it's, de it's declining uh, twice as fast. It declines actually slower. It's a much lower level in chimpanzees. So this is consistent overall with the idea that the thing that really accounts for, at least contributes to how we do it, is what's going on within our adrenals. So we have a whole array of things that are consequences of that. And just to come back to gene culture coevolution, I, I want to note that additional implications of having a life history like that, that take us back to why we're so cultural, might lie in the sorts of social interactions that then occur between mothers and infants and young siblings. Thank you.